afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the breakout sessions. I don't have any prizes for you, but I just want to gauge how many of you found it difficult to find what you're looking for on the website that you were testing. I sat in the end of uh, the Northern Europe session, and I heard a funny conversation that uh, it took five people to find a filter on the page, which apparently to this website they thought was super important. So now they have some homework to do when they get back. Uh, and today, as you can see, my talk is titled Design for Accessibility. Uh, accessibility means having a website that can be accessed by people of all abilities, um, allowing them to navigate your site without barriers. But really, this should be titled Designing for Everyone. Um, because as you learned this afternoon, it's great to run user tests um, in whatever form you have available to you, um, if it's with your colleagues or um, in the Northern Europe session, I heard some team is uh, running these kind of sessions every Friday and having nice copy chats about it, uh, about what they can improve. That's also a really great idea. Um, but just know that when you are limiting your audience to people in tech companies that are very design forward, you're really limiting your audience to a narrow scope and you could potentially be leaving out um, a bunch of other people who have different abilities than we're familiar with. So rather than thinking about how we can design for people with disabilities specifically, we want to think about ways that we can create a great experience for everybody regardless of their abilities. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of the screen, I first presented this content or a shorter version of it at an online webinar called Mobile UX Marathon. So the content is still available for you to access and watch about usability best practices. And when I participated in this program, I was really excited that this was called Mobile UX Marathon. Because as a former marathon runner myself, um, and talking about accessibility, I learned a lot about running actually from my uncle who was blind. And at the time, I was looking to train for my first marathon in London. Um, I wasn't a runner. I was the kind of person who, if I was late to a meeting, I wouldn't even run for the bus. <laughs> so my, my uncle, who was actually an avid treadmill runner, he lent me a book as I was training, and it was called The Non-Runner's the non Marathon, The Non-Runner's Guide to Marathon Running. And this was really relevant and helpful for me at the time because I had zero experience, and it really got me the motivation and tips to get going. But beyond marathon running, um, my uncle also taught me a lot about web accessibility and assistive technologies long before I ever decided to become a web developer. So, um, and the reason for this is because my uncle was my first employer. When I was 15 years old, I was working for him at a coffee shop that he had opened in San Francisco. And he taught, through this experience, I learned a lot about uh, patience, empathy, creating great coffee, and um, even working through uh, really complex Excel formulas. So finally, in my early web development path, I took a lot of these learnings from a basic job at a coffee shop um, to really design with inclusive thinking from the very start. So a lot of this learning came from the simplicity of uh, watching him interact with technology on a daily basis. And this is just a glimpse of some of the technologies that he used um, on the daily. So I'll just walk through a few of these to explain to you because I realize when I talk about this topic, there's quite little awareness about assistive tools and for me, having exposure to this at such an early age, I was quite lucky to understand this quite young. So the first tool that you see here is a Braille typewriter. Um, it's no more than 12 keys, and basically it types um, into different textures of the Braille language that my uncle could understand. So even sometimes talking to him in a regular conversation, he would be typing notes. Maybe I said something important, or maybe he was typing up my performance review. Who knows? <laughs> Um, but this was really useful for him to get down some notes, be able to access it quickly, and he would store it away in a filing cabinet. Next up, it's a tool called Zoom Text. So it allows him to zoom into the screen up to 16 times. Um, because he had limited vision, this was helpful for him to see a very narrow view of the screen, sometimes just a couple of words at a time. And when I had to switch back and forth with him on the computer, this was a little bit frustrating, to be honest, because um, I had to like navigate my way out of this zoomed-in uh, viewport. And if you thought mobile screens were limited, then think again. Um, but 
and, you know, even though this was difficult for me in the few seconds a day that I had to use it, or a few minutes, um, it really made me realize how difficult it could be for someone like my uncle to be navigating a really poorly, navigate, uh, poorly designed website. And next is high contrast mode, which is available on most operating systems. Um, basically, in the accessibility settings, you can set an inverted color, uh, color scheme so that it's easier on the eyes, especially if you're zoomed in really closely. So this is also something common with hardcore programmers if you're coding late in the nights. And even more recently, it's been coined as dark mode in a lot of uh, new UI patterns. So this was a really great combination uh, with the zoom text. And the next is a screen reader, which is a I guess pretty well known um, assistive technology. Uh, as the name implies, it reads out what is in focus on the screen. So as a user is tabbing through the website, it would read out search, for example, because this is a search icon. And um, there are a bunch of different brands of screen readers out there, but this one is called JAWS. Um, lastly, there's um, accessibility settings for uh, tablets, like the iPad here. Um, and this kind of brings together all of the assistive tools that you have on your website, um, kind of all in one device. So for example, voiceover to kind of mimic what a screen reader would do, um, zooming tools, inverting colors, all those kind of tools to help people with uh, limited vision or other assistive needs. And although there were a lot of tools that I mentioned, these are just some of the many tools out there to assist people with disabilities. And this is only for people with vision impairments, but this is just a very narrow scope within the broad spectrum of different abilities in the human's um, ability set. So it's important not to think simply as how do I design for this brand of screen reader or this specific zoom level or the iPhone 5 um, viewport. Think about how can I design a product that is accessible and delightful to as many people as possible based on what I know about the different human conditions. So as you might know, um, as Sundar announced at IO19, and actually for the past 21 years of Google, our mission statement is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. And when I first started as a front-end developer at Google five years ago in California, I, was, I learned really quickly how big of a responsibility this was to build websites for um, sometimes audiences of millions or more, and to make sure that with a far-reaching and global audience to make this work for everyone of all abilities, all network conditions, all across the globe. And uh, I am very proud to have the word accessible and useful, like literally in our mission statement, because this is not very common. Uh, and it creates, just having these words in the statement creates the awareness and desire to learn more about how we can make our products more useful and accessible to everyone. And even if we're not all experts in the topic, which we're not expected to be, um, it at least creates a, a little bit of curiosity. It sparks some interest for us to learn more about how we can learn to build empathy and understand our users of different abilities. So let's take a step back at our full spectrum of users. When it comes to the importance of a user's mobile web experience, we asked hundreds of people what was the most important. And we found that speed was the number one factor impacting a user's web experience. So Mustafa will talk about that later today. And I really want to focus more deeply on the ease of, how, of finding what you're looking for on the page. Because when it comes to findability, accessibility is super crucial. It's even more, way more important than how attractive the site looks. So if you think those light grays that are hard to read are important, think again. And let's talk numbers now. How many of you would like to increase the reach of your website to a billion more people? Yes. This, this number, more than one billion people, this is the amount of people around the world who have some form of disabilities. So that's the number that you could potentially be leaving out if you don't think inclusively in earlier in the design process. And as much as I don't like to talk about money, if you have to do this with stakeholders or decision makers, um, you should understand that 8 trillion US dollars is the amount of collective disposable income for people with disabilities and their friends and family worldwide. So if you have a really poorly accessible website and somebody is having a difficult time navigating this, they might be um, uh, recommending it uh, against their friends and telling them not to use it. So this is why we uh, a study by Gartner has included 
friends and families of people with disabilities. And again, it's not all about the money, because in a study of one million websites by the HTTP archive, we found an average of 60 errors per page. So this results, uh, this is a total of a million or so errors, and we found that the, the most common ones were in, high con in a low contrast, which is like such an easy fix. So if, you're provi if um, you consider the amount of accessibility issues out there, we're really providing our users with a suboptimal experience, and in some cases, even not usable. But back to zooming in on accessibility, just to redefine it for you, accessibility deals with ensuring people um, specifically with disabilities can perceive and navigate your website as they intend. Um, but when you do address these accessibility issues, you're usually making it easier for the wider audience. And um, accessibility is actually a, a crucial part about inclusive design, which uh, deals with the, fuller, uh, the wider range of human abilities, including language, culture, gender, and age. As we saw from Jens's presentation this morning, it was really cool to see how they tackled um, including the global audience going around in a van and testing their product with people in different markets. So this is uh, something that is um, critical to inclusive design. And within this topic, accessibility is a really great starting point and provides great coverage of inclusive design. And in the end, the broader goal is to, um, to strive for uh, really great usability. So all of these topics kind of roll up to usability, and this is the umbrella that brings it all together, because only by hearing from a diverse set of users um, of different abilities, whether it's in the accessibility realm or in inclusive design, then this is the only way that we can fully understand their challenges and experiences and have the insights to build a better web for everyone. So let's talk about what it means to be accessible from a technical standpoint. I'll just quickly go through the technicalities, but I think it's important to understand the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is a set of guidelines out there to make your site more accessible to people with disabilities. And this is kind of um, a non-governing body, but there's a lot of legal action these days um, that are based on the WCAG. Uh, for example, the recently passed European Accessibility Act, which requires sites to be more accessible, even now including consumer websites. So while I'm not here to give you legal advice, I think it's really important to look this up and see if your business might be affected. So the four kind of high level um, requirements within the WCAG are that a website should be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And just to quickly talk through some examples of this, um, to be perceivable means the user obviously should be able to perceive it with at least one of their senses, whether it's sight, hearing, um, having high enough contrast if they have limited sight, and for example, something more familiar is if you're on your mobile device, they should be able to perceive what they can within their, um, the viewport that they have. And the user should be able to operate it, so for example, being able to tab through it if they're on the keyboard, um, having big enough touch targets so that they can access even with fingers of all sizes. Uh, and it should be understandable. So content shouldn't be beyond their understanding, whether it's in terms of comprehension, language, um, and uh, all the different reading levels uh, that people have in their language. And it should be robust enough for different user agents. For example, I mentioned screen readers is one way that people can access uh, a website or lower end devices on a poor network. Uh, these are all guidelines that focus primarily on how to make your website more accessible to people with disabilities. But as I mentioned, addressing this audience can help you um, create a more beneficial experience for all. So even if you have clear vision, hearing, um, movement or cognitive abilities, it's important to consider the different needs of the, in the wide spectrum of our users. So I want to share with you five tips to improve your website's accessibility and ultimately build a better web experience for everyone. Um, they're, all, they're five very simple tips, but that's also the point I want to make. It's not that difficult to address the, the needs of different users. Um, as long as we can understand how, um, understand how we can relate to people with, with um, assistive needs, then we can better, under, better design a process that works better for everyone. So the first tip relates back to vision impairments. And globally, it's 
it's estimated that 1.3 billion people live with some form of vision impairments. So it's important to make sure our, the content is presented clearly and legibly for people of uh, all ranges of vision impairments. And ultimately, this makes it better for people even with full vision. Like if you're on your mobile device on the go, like likely a small font size is going to be really difficult to process while you're walking around or if there's a glare on your phone. And um, a very recent example that excites me is a recent Android redesign. So something as simple as turning the fonts to black instead of the really bright green makes it really easy to read. Adding some hints of blue to the green shade is also um, kind of complementing really nicely. And something like changing from the letters, it's no longer Q and it's 10. Like this also makes it more accessible with the, the dessert names that they, they once coined with each letter of the alphabet. So, something that would start with a Q that would have been in this release would maybe be difficult for people in other markets to understand. And designing for accessibility doesn't mean you have to stick to the plain black and whites. There's a huge range of color contrast tools out there to help you design a really fun and playful color palette. And for example, the, to the material design color tool can let you um, distinguish a color palette up front um, while telling you whether or not the combinations are accessible or not. And a more tangible example of how this can impact your business, this is from the bag company Eastpac. They wanted to test um, improving the visibility of their ghost buttons. And while maybe accessibility wasn't a primary concern here, it's obvious to see that the after result is way more accessible than the first one. And the results didn't lie. In each country that they tested this in, conversion rates went up by a lot. And now, if you look at their websites, they're, they're using the same kind of black and white contrast that they've uh, understood to test really well. And next up, we want to not only make sure our content is visually clear, but also understandable in terms of cognition. So use language and, culture and um, structure that is intuitive and concise. Because users have varying levels of, um, of reading abilities, and even though English is the most commonly, um, commonly spoken language on the web, it is not as widely understood across the globe as we think it is. Even in the US, the reading levels are really low. So aim to make content as clear and concise as possible, and this will help users to digest it easily. So we have a free course called the um, Win on Mobile. It's, uh, it's a CRO course where you can learn more about um, how to enhance your conversion rate optimization at winonmobile.withgoogle.com. Kind of hard to see at the bottom there. But it, there's a section on designing for clarity. And um, the first tip that they share is to remove all the unnecessary words. So um, there was a nice quote here about cutting your content in half and then cutting it in half again. And that's how you're going to achieve clarity. Um, using bullet points can really help the user to find the information that they need quickly and easily. And using clear headings and subheadings can go a long way for uh, users to understand the hierarchy. And in turn, you're also going to get some SEO benefits by letting search engines understand what's more important. And finally, using icons to get your message across, especially when accompanying text. Um, for example, when I'm browsing Dutch websites back in Amsterdam, I, the icons really help me to understand words that I don't yet know. And if there are color-based UI, UI hints that are not enough, icons can really help here. So one, another real example by the online print platform called HelloPrint, Rather than uh, reducing unnecessary words, they went as far as reducing entire elements that were not necessary. So this is all the way in the checkout flow, where obviously when they're kind of confirming their final details, all this information in the footer is not necessary. So they wanted to reduce distractions and help their users get to the checkout much quicker. And the results here, they saw a 1.3% conversion rate uplift. It doesn't sound like a lot, but in a year's time, this can earn them 377,000 euros. So if, imagine, if this is something at the bottom of the page, at the end of the checkout, imagine what a big impact this can make on a more prominent element of your website. And next up, we want to offer easier data entry to accommodate more users and reduce friction. So at the beginning of the day, Brian shared some frustration about entering his details and not having the rights number pad for entering his phone number or his, uh, his uh, license number. And this is something that is a, it's a problem that's way too common on the web. Um, 
with regards, with regards to people with disabilities, people with limited dexterity can have trouble with this, but even for me, when I'm on the go on my mobile device, I don't want to type anything on my mobile. Like, I just want to make it as quick and frictionless as possible. Um, so here's another example of having way too many inputs. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this frustration, but when it comes to business impact, we found that 28% of cart abandonments were due to too long or too complicated checkout processes. So this is something you can completely avoid or reduce as much as possible if you are able to simplify, for example, card inputs, um, even login options can be simplified. So here's an example of a, a simplified login um, process. The company called Drixo, they wanted to reduce barriers of login, of course, um, and in the beginning they had uh, a long form where you had to scroll down to see a different login option or like all the way down you can maybe log in on Facebook or get help because you can't find anything on this page. But finally they were able to reduce it drastically and everything kind of fit on one page or at least all the most important information. So the results showed in the numbers as well with a 2.5% conversion rate uplift and ultimately they also proved um, a one year business value of over 300,000 euros. And speaking of getting things done faster, um, it's important to speed up, especially if you're expanding to um, emerging markets or globally. Um, and again, Mustafa will talk a little bit more about designing for speed, but I just wanna touch upon this a little bit in regards to accessibility. So um, we tend to overrate, overestimate the power of 4G, especially in um, regions like where I'm based in Northern Europe, where we boast some of the highest 4G speeds in the world. And in the Netherlands specifically, we have the second fastest speeds, but I still experience dropouts when I'm um, walking around my neighborhood. Sometimes I lose connection. If I'm on the train, obviously, I'm going to lose connection. So it's, it's really important not to overestimate this power. And even with 5G supposedly coming soon, it's gonna experience a really slow adoption and really, um, it's gonna take a while for everyone to get up to speed pun intended, or not. <laughs> um, so when Pinterest, um, a lot of designers in the room probably are using Pinterest, maybe in the app version, but when they were looking to ex expand to um, emerging markets, they knew that the web experience was really important to get right. So they wanted to focus on Im in improving their mobile website, seeing that the conversion rate was not up to par. Um, because in emerging markets, apps tend to be less popular since they take up a lot of space and data and um, network connection is scarce. So in this case, Progressive Web Apps was the perfect solution because they were able to one-up their web experience while allowing their, yeah, allowing their users to get the same benefits as an app while taking up less space and uh, less data from their phones. So they were able to have some simplified login options, uh, it had offline functionality, the ability to add to the home screen, all from a website. So um, there's a case study, you can look this up um, to find out the details of what they implemented, in um, including speed benefits. Uh, and as a result, they were able to maintain performance year over year. So right away they saw 100%, over 100% increase in weekly users, and this was even tripled in low bandwidth areas where it really mattered. And as a result, they were um, directly tied to their revenue, they were able to um, increase their pins, the number of pins seen by 600%, which of course translates to better, um, more visibility in advertisements and more money for Pinterest. Then finally, it's important to support assistive technologies that are relevant to your platform. So as I mentioned this, uh, in the beginning, there, was, there are screen readers, for example, um, some pe people who are navigating with their keyboard or different methods of touch or using the mouse. Um, just as you support those different methods, it's important to consider what assistive technologies are out there. And um, some examples that Google is using, um, voice notes on calendar, and um, I don't know if anyone has discovered the voice dictation from Google, Google Docs, but I found that this is also super helpful even for me not having uh, any uh, like motor impairments, which this was originally designed for. It's super easy to get my thoughts onto a Google Doc just by talking. Um, and something that maybe you're more familiar with is YouTube captions, because even people, like, uh, while captions were designed for people with hearing impairments, this is also really helpful for people who are on their mobile devices and don't want to blast their volume and disturb all, the, all your neighbors on the bus. Um, so this is a few examples of how assistive technologies developed for people with disabilities can really benefit the general public. And um, going back to screen readers, 
um, this is just one example of how you can address screen readers um, who are navigating with a tab or some kind of switch device. So if, when you get on the site, you won't see the skip to content link, but if the user presses tab or some kind of navigation to get to the next step, they will see this link pop up, which they can um, choose to select if they want to skip all this navigation, which would otherwise be read out loud one by one. And you can imagine how painful that might be. So this is one really simple technique to let users access your information more quickly, but something that is still often overlooked. And when combining all of these techniques, um, improving visibility on your websites, keeping your content clear and concise, simplifying the input methods, speeding up the load times, and supporting assistive technology, you're really creating a delightful and more usable experience for everyone. And these are just, again, these are five very high level guidelines to get you thinking about accessibility and inclusive design earlier on in the process. But of course, there's a lot more to dive deeper into. So if you want to uh, read even more about this, these topics, uh, the full article is on Think with Google. And at the end, there's also some um, links to take action, including uh, the web.dev measurement tool. So this is hooked up to um, Google's Lighthouse uh, audit, which allows you to um, view your performance score, how fast your website is, your accessibility score, so how many best practices you followed and what kind of recommendations you can um, uh, fix to improve your accessibility, and some other best practices that you can find, that you can identify on your website. So just to point out one last technology that my uncle has more recently been using, um, one day, I didn't know he was using the Google Home until one day he called me to share some fun facts that he learned about Dutch weather and culture that he had learned from asking his Google Assistant. So this was funny because I also have been using the Google Home lately and more, more so for this use case. As someone who has 20-20 vision and more impairments in the Dutch culture, I'm, I'm using uh, the Google Assistant for translations, asking for translations from Dutch to English daily. Um, and it's incredible to realize that um, a, te a technology like voice assistance, which was originally developed for people with, with um, vision impairments, this has been useful and really uh, innovative in terms of creating solutions for people of all abilities. So it's amazing how this technology can evolve to create innovation. And I just want to close off by reminding you that inclusion breeds innovation. And designing for a wider audience and thinking about uh, thinking more inclusively from the start is going to help you create better solutions for all. Thank you.